just want to bring our attention to some of the fundamentals of Christian living. And I want to share with you this morning on the topic of the heart with a desire for God. The heart with a desire for God. What kind of a heart is it and what are the fundamentals and the elements of a heart with a desire for God. The word desire is something that we use many times in the life that we live in. People have a desire for gold, people have a desire for wealth, people have a desire for fame, people have a desire for power, people have a desire for specific individuals, and people even talk about a burning desire, and people talk about sacrificing something else for fulfilling your desires. There are people who buy their homes with all their savings, there are people who borrow money and buy a home, and they cut corners in terms of the budgets in order to possess what they want. And for the rest of their lives, they keep cutting corners in order to, uh, you know, pay back the debt that they have taken for the loan uh, that they've taken for buying a home or whatever it is. So desire is, a, is something that drives human society in terms of how they function, how they behave. And many times we think that desire is wrong, desire is not good. But the word desire, if you really look at it, is something which is good. Uh, it's a godly quality. Because God also has a desire. Let me take you to Zephaniah chapter 3 verse 17. And you would see what is driving God's desire there. It says, the Lord your God is mighty in your midst. <laughs> the mighty one will save you. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you with his love. He will rejoice over you with singing. Now here you see that God having something deep down in his heart, which is showing in the way he behaves with us with us human beings, with us as children. He says, the mighty one will save you. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you with his love. He will rejoice over you with singing. You will rejoice over somebody with singing only when you want that person so badly in your life. And those of you who are parents or those of you who have been with little children, little babies, singing comes very naturally when you see that baby. People make funny faces. People try to kind of capture their attention. People try to grab them. And you also have, you know, even in social context, when you meet for a family gathering or a church gathering, there's a small baby that somebody has. You know, people flock around that mom or the dad and try to kind of, you know, spend some time with the child. Now, that's a desire that we have. And when we have that kind of a desire, we even go and we communicate with the child. The child doesn't really communicate back. At the most, a smile. You go to a month-old baby and ask, what's your name? And stuff like that. And yes, that's how it is, like unconditional love that flows in. When God has that kind of a love towards us, he will rejoice over you with singing. That po that's possible only when God has a desire for us. So desire is something that's driving that kind of an attribute or a character or the quality of God. And God also expects a reciprocation, and he seeks men and women who desire him. In Psalm 53, verses 2 to 3, it shows what God is looking for. It says, God looks down from heaven upon the children of men to see if there are any who understand, who seek God. Every one of them has turned aside. They have together become corrupt. There is none who does good, no, not one. The heart of God has been to go and search for those who desire him. Those who seek him and fellowship with them, have that beautiful relationship with them. But unfortunately, it also says here that every one of them have turned aside. They have together become corrupt. There is none who does good. No, not one. The same passage is echoed in Romans chapter 3, verses 10 to 12. You would find as it is written, there is none righteous. No, not one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks after God. They all have turned aside. They have together become unprofitable. There is none who does good. No, not one. God's heart is constantly searching for such people who desire him. Constantly searching across the lengths and breadths of the earth. Trying to find those people who are desiring him. Those people who are seeking him. Just the way that he wants to fellowship with them, he wants to fellowship with them to fellowship with him as well. 
In the book of Ezekiel chapter 14, verse 14, the Bible talks about three men who have been shown as examples of living a righteous life. It says, even if these three men, Noah, Daniel, and Job, were in it, it talks about a city which was about to destroy, to be destroyed. It said, they would deliver only themselves by their righteousness, says the Lord. Isn't that amazing? The Bible talks about our righteousness being like filthy rags. The Bible also notes and quotes the righteousness of three individuals, that is Noah, Daniel, and Job, who in their generation, God was able to preserve mankind through the life of Noah. God was able to challenge the kingdom of darkness through the life of Job. God was able to challenge the powers of the earth through the life of Daniel. And these three lives are being quoted here as examples of righteousness. And such people who seek God and God alone is what God is looking for on a constant basis. Let me also tell you that when we talk about desiring God and seeking God, it's only those who have experienced redemption through God, who have experienced God in a special way, who have tasted Him, can go ahead and desire Him more. It's only those who are redeemed who desire Him. In Psalm 10 verse 4, it talks about the wicked. It says, the wicked in his proud countenance does not see God. God is none in none of his thoughts. And we have a lot of people who are of that nature around us. Sometimes we behave that way as well. It's a pride of life comes in when we know and we think that we do not know, we don't need somebody to help us. And these days you have people around us who do not want help in their lives. Not that they do not have needs, but they just do not want others to get involved. And many times we behave like that as well. It says the wicked in his proud countenance does not see God. They do not need the help of men. They do not need the help of their families. They do not need the help of a pastor from a church. And they would even turn around and say, I do not need a help from God. I would like to manage my own life. Now that's pride. And that hurts God so deeply inside his heart because God is a God who wants to get involved in our lives. God is a God who wants to be part of our lives. God is a God who wants to have him, have us close to him and he wants to be in us and with us. When people have riches or wealth and they put their trust in that riches and their wealth or if they have a bunch of friends who they think are going to help them or if they trust in their own capabilities or their competencies, they stand up and say, you know what, everything is fine with me. I can manage life on my own. Unfortunate. You go and tell them, do you need any help? Thanks for asking. I don't need any help. And this has become a fashion statement nowadays for people to set a space for themselves and say, this is my life and I want to do it my way kind of stuff. But when crisis hits, when people realize that they need something which is beyond their capabilities, that's when they run to God. And people look at desiring what God gives. There's a di di the difference between desiring what God gives versus desiring God. Many times we have an attitude towards God as if God is an ATM. We go to a place of worship thinking that God is there. And I can stand up there in front of God and I can put my prayers in front of God and I can ask Him what I want and I can have the dialogue with Him and I can take something from there and I can walk back blessed. But if that doesn't happen, that's not a place to go to. We look at a place of worship like a cash machine. And when we think that that place, nothing happens, we think it's an empty place and we walk out from there. It's an unfortunate thing. It's, it's, it's like idolatry. The mindset of idolatry is like you go to that place you seek something and you take back something from there and you go back. And if you don't need something, I don't even go there. 
It's not a relationship. It's a transaction. In Psalm 115, you would find a description of idols and people who trust in idols. It says, those idols have ears, but they cannot hear. They have got eyes, but they cannot see. They've got mouths, but they cannot speak. And those who put their trust in such idols and those who worship such idols also behave like them. And that's what happens many times. Like you stand up there and say, like, you know, I've given you a thousand candles as I promised you. And I've been coming here for the last one year hoping that you'll give me a good wife or hoping that that particular boy that I'm in love with would say yes, but nothing happens. Don't you hear me? Nothing happens. You scream at the top of your voice, nothing happens. But that's not God. That's not God at all. Right? And these kind of transactions like are only you know, for the material things that people look for or the emotional comfort that people look for, but not really looking for God himself. But God looks for something even more deeper. God looks at the heart. God looks at a dwelling place inside of you. God looks at having that beautiful relationship so that he is always with us, not in a particular place that you go to. So somebody said this, that the church is not the steeple, but the people. And many times when people trust in a steeple or a big church as an edifice, as a huge building or as a monument, that building itself becomes like an idol. It can happen in any religion for that matter. The place becomes an idol because you go there valuing that place, forgetting that God values you and he wants to have that relationship. In Genesis chapter 4, you would find uh, the life of Cain having that kind of an attitude when he goes with an offering. And you would find that that offering was not accepted by God, but his response to that non-acceptance was not really the way God expected him to respond. Abel also brought the firstborn of his flock and of their uh, fat, and the Lord respected Abel and his offering. But he did not respect Cain and his offering, and Cain was very angry, and his countenance fell. When you offer something to somebody, and that somebody doesn't accept it, what would be your reaction? Your reaction would be, would would have to be, ideally, uh, is this a gift that I brought which you do not need? Or is it a gift which, with some fault? Or is there something about me that you do not like? Can we talk about it? Is there something that I need to change about myself? There's something wrong fundamentally. Rather, if the attitude was, I brought this for you, you haven't accepted it, hence I'm angry with you. I don't want to see your face anymore kind of a stuff. His countenance fell, which means that his face fell. He no longer gave contact to God with his face or with his eyes. The attitude was totally against what God would have expected there to have a dialogue, to have a soul searching, and to go back and ask, why, Lord? You accepted his offering, but not mine. Can you tell me why? Is there a problem with what I brought? Is there a problem with my heart? Is there a problem with my life? Is there something that we need to change so that we can have a relationship? Because I know you as not a God who rejects, but as a God who accepts. We don't see that. We also don't see that attitude in Genesis chapter 25 in verses 32 to 34 from the life of Esau. Now Esau had a problem. Esau had a problem with impatience. He had a problem with desperation. And that's what happens when we are in a time of need. How do we react in a situation of desperation? Now, this guy was hungry. He comes back. And when he was hungry, he goes to the point of selling his birthright for the food that his brother was making. Now look at what it says here. And, es and Esau said, look, I'm about to die. How many of you have fasted here? Skipped a meal? Come on, you can be bold enough to lift your hands, right? Sometimes we don't skip a meal because we fast, but if you're stuck in a meeting in an office, you skip a meal anyway. 
but you don't die. You don't die because of that. And look at what he's saying. Look, I'm about to die. That's a sense of desperation. So what is this birthright to me? Then Jacob said, swear to me as of this day. So he swore to him and sold his birthright to Jacob. And Jacob gave Esau bread and a stew of lentils. That is basically dal, if you think something else. It's like dal. Okay? Dal roti. Yeah? Bread and stew of lentils. Then he ate and drank, arose and went his way. Thus Esau despised his birthright. Now if you turn with me to Hebrews chapter 12, verse 17. Now, chapter 12 of Hebrews talks about faith, talks about the race that we all run. And chapter 11 talks about a gallery of people who are a cloud of witnesses who walk by faith. And the last part of chapter 11 actually says, though they walk by faith, many of them have not got what they actually asked for. They've ended their life on earth with disappointment, but they're still heroes of faith, sitting in the hall of fame of faith. And standing out there in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1, as a cloud of witnesses. And then it says, you run your race with endurance. And as you move on to verse 12, among all those good examples that are spoken of, there's an example of Esau that is given there as a bad example. It says, for you know that afterward, when he, that is Esau, wanted to inherit the blessing, he was rejected. For he found no place for repentance though he sought it diligently with tears. You know, that was the point of desperation that he led himself to. That was the kind of a behavior that he led himself to where he showed that he was very, very, very transactional in his approach. I want this for now and I cannot have patience kind of an attitude. Now, that's not the kind of attitude that God would expect out of any of us who claim to have a relationship with him or who want to have a deeper relationship with him. It is not a transaction. It is a bond. It is a relationship. It's like cleaving together. Now, the desire for God actually takes us to that level of oneness with him. I want to leave with you four principles this afternoon on how we can have that kind of a desire for God. The first one is the principle of ongoingness. It's a principle of ongoingness. It's not a desire that comes only for a moment when you're in a time of need. I want to go to the church today. Why do you want to go to the church today? Because I feel like going to the church today. Something good has happened in my life yesterday, so I want to go and give thanks. All right? Why haven't you gone to the church for the last one week or last one month? Oh, well, I haven't gone to the church for the last one month because I was feeling down. Or maybe nothing much was happening in my life. And I've been praying and nothing much has happened in my life. Nothing happened. So finally when something happens, I'm going there. Why are you going? Because I want to give a thanksgiving offering. Or I just want to go and give an offering to the church. Or whatever it is. I want to go and light a bunch of candles or maybe give a bunch of flowers. You know, there are some places where it happens. Some places of worship where people give something. Hey, hang on. God doesn't need your flowers in exchange for what he has given you. He owns the cattle on a thousand hills. He owns all the gardens of the whole wide world. And everything that you see, which is a beautiful creation, is his. That's not a desire for God. It's a transaction. All right. I'm going to reciprocate what God has done for me so that next time when he does something for me, he remembers that that account is settled kind of a stuff. People have this kind of attitudes as well. But it, let me tell you, a desire for God produces a desire for the place of God and a desire to always be in a place where God is and to be with God. And that's a desire for God because I don't come here for what you give, but I come here for you. Do you have friends who come and tell you that they just want to come and spend some time with you? Anywhere. In the office, in the college, in the church, in your neighborhood. Can we just have a cup of coffee? You want to spend some time? It's rare to find friends like that these days, but sometimes when somebody says that, you also feel suspicious because this guy needs something from you. 
And that's the depravity that the world has come to these days. Gone are those days where people just enjoy hanging around with each other. God just wants to hang around with you. Hallelujah. Aren't you excited about it? He just wants to hang around with you. He just wants to be with you. You say, come on, let's just hang around. I'll sing a song for you. Would you sing a song for me? I'll speak something to you. Would you say something to me? Let's just have a nice time together. You know that word that we use, fellowship with the Lord. What do you mean by fellowship with the Lord? It's just being there with God. Enjoying His presence. When you sit there, when you're fellowshipping with a friend or a cup of coffee, just because that friend is just your friend, right? And for old time's sake, you met up your school friend after 30 years. How many of you have been through that experience? An old friend, you just caught up. What do you do when you catch up with those friends? You speak about your old teachers or, you know, those days when you poured ink on somebody's books or whatever it is, right? You don't sit and talk, okay, uh, can you do this for me? Can you, that kind of stuff. You don't get into a transaction mode. It's a relationship mode. That's what it is all about. It's not really looking at what do I get from this guy, but it's really looking at can I have this person all for myself? And can I let that person have me for himself or herself, whatever be it. And that's what God is looking for. In Psalm 27 verse 4, which was read to us this morning during the time of worship, it says, one thing I have desired of the Lord that I will seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. So we just read that this morning. We sang a few songs, but I want to reemphasize this morning. This is what the psalmist is saying, that there's only one thing that, uh, that he desires. What is that? All through the days, he wants to be in the house of the Lord. Now, what is the house of the Lord? That doesn't mean that you guys, you know, sell your homes and Live here. Right? I'm sure Pastor David will have a tough job to do at that point of time. He'll look at how to cater to so many people and it's not really a good proposition to make, right? When you move on to the New Testament, what is the house of the Lord? You are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Because Jesus died on the cross, gave his life. After giving his life, he goes up to heaven. And he says, I'm going to come back and live with you. I'm going to send a helper for you. That's the Holy Spirit. He sent down his own spirit to come and live inside of you. You know, the whole tables are turned upside down. There's no need for us to go into the house of the Lord, to dwell with the house of God. But God says, I want to come down and I want to make you my house to dwell with you forever. Hallelujah. Isn't that amazing? We have a God who's got that burning desire. And if I were to flip this verse, God might be saying, one thing that I desire of man, that I will seek, that I may dwell in my house, which is his body, all the days of, my, of his life, and I would behold my beauty in him, and we both would inquire of each other and fellowship with each other. How do you like that? Isn't that amazing? That's God's desire for us and he wants us to have that desire for him. All the days of our life, that's the principle of ongoingness. Not just in my times of need, not just in my times of jubilation, even in times of my silence, all the days of my life, with a sense of ongoingness, I will dwell with him. And that goes on and on. Even after we die, it's a relationship that we carry with God. In Psalm 116, verse 15, it says, Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. Now, we don't talk about death very often. We don't like the word death that, that much. Well, let me tell you, when there's a death, 
there is sorrow in the house where there's a death. But do you think the person who's gone ahead is sorrowful? For that person, it's like a homecoming. You know, last night I was, I was reading uh, in a news item about a band by the name The Voice. And there was a shooting that happened, a uh, killing that happened in one of the cities in the U.S. where this band was playing. And the main singer of the band, a lady by name Christina Jimney, uh, that's the name that uh, I never heard this name before. I never heard this name of the band before. But I was reading through that. The person who killed her killed himself later on. But somewhere in that whole um, news item, the manager of the band um, mentions this, that Christina has gone, gone home to be with the Lord. Now, I don't know if she was a believer or not, whether she was a Christian or not, or maybe she is. Praise God if she is. But the word gone home is so powerful, isn't it? Now, how many of you would identify with this when you go to your ancestral home and then you have a family get together and you go there and then say hey do you know Johnny you broke this table when you were three years old you know how this crack appeared there I mean there are so many beautiful remembrances of that place and those of you who have been children I'm sure all of us have been children at some point of time how does it feel at three o'clock in the afternoon when you finish school do you feel like staying out there in the school or do you wait for the bus to take you home? And when you walk in home, whew, you got your siblings there. You got your parents there. You got your grandparents. Whoever is there who's taking care of you, now that's home. And you just want to drop your bags. And you just want to talk. Talk. Be cared for. How many of you can identify with that? It's a nice feeling, right? I don't, I'm, I'm sure none of us want to stay back in the school. That's what it feels like when you go home. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints because that occasion is an occasion of homecoming when Jesus is standing up there welcoming people and the Father in heaven is saying, come home. There's so much to share. There's so much to talk about. There's so much for me to give. In John chapter 10, verse 28, it says, And I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. Now that's the statement of a warrior. He says, I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish, and no one can snatch them away out of my hand. I'm holding them. No one can snatch them away from there. Now, that's the statement of a redeemer. That's the statement of a victorious king who has redeemed his people, saying that nobody can break this relationship. A principle of ongoingness at work. From this point onwards, from the point of redemption till the end of time, this relationship will stand. Even if the person dies here on earth, that relationship will go on. We got to look at that from that kingdom perspective. When two people get married, we tell that what God has joined together, let no man separate. We pronounce that into people's lives. Isn't it the same about this principle as well? What God has joined together between son and man, between man and God, let no power or principality of darkness separate. Romans chapter 8, it talks about what can separate us from the love of Christ. Nothing. Poverty, sickness, death, nothing. No power or principality. It's the same principle of the cleaving that happens there. Forever. It is sealed by the covenant. In, Psalm, uh, in John chapter 14, verse 2, John chapter 14, verse 2, it says, In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. Which means that this relationship of the desire for being together between God and man is an ongoing relationship. The principle of ongoingness. There is no end to it. 
and there are no sporadic moments to it. It's always and forever. Can you say that to yourself? It's always and forever. Let's move next to the second principle, the principle of oneness. The principle of oneness is one where your desire for God reveals to us that you are of God. Your desire for God reveals to others that you are of God. If you belong to God, you will reflect the nature of God. You know, you b belong to a family. Like, you know, many times, you know, you have in families, you know, family get-togethers, people sit there. Okay, your brother looks like your mom. Your sister looks like your dad. But you don't look like either of them. I mean, these are ridiculous conversations sometimes people have. And then somebody has to jump in and say, well, he looks like himself because God has made him unique. Come on, give that kid a break here. You know, for a couple of years, I grew up thinking that I was adopted into my family. You know, sometimes you think, right, so why did my dad scold me? Why did my mom scold me? Like, you know, and all that kind of stuff. And then you also have funny statements that people make at times. You know what? We actually found you in a bus stop. We just picked you up from there, you know, that kind of stuff. And, you know, the small children, what goes in their mind? We don't really, you know, think through that. And they grow up. Too much of those kind of statements or sometimes even too much movies uh, as well. But when you are from a family, you behave like you are from that family. You reflect the nature of that family, don't you? And if you are a child of God, you behave like a child of God and you reflect the nature of God. And that's what we are called for. The oneness principle talks about you being one with God when you're desiring God. And when you're one with God, something of God gets rubbed onto you and that keeps increasing day after day and the more you spend time with God, you start showing the nature and the glory of God even more brightly. In John chapter 15, verse 4 to 8, Jesus talks about this oneness principle in that uh, whole illustration that he gives of the wine and the branches. And he talks about this when he says, abide in me and I in you as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit for without me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered. And they gather them and throw them into the fire. And they are burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire. It will be done for you. By this my Father is glorified that you may bear much fruit so you will be my disciples. If you have a go-up tree in your house, what comes out of a go-up tree? Apples, you wake up in the morning, it's a goa tree, it's the leaves smell like goa and then you wake up in the morning, you find apples on the tree. There's something seriously wrong. All right, you have a goa tree which is giving you apples. Every branch in that goa tree would give you what? Goa. Goa tree which is giving you goa, not apples, okay? A goa tree which is giving you goa. Every branch gives you? Goas. And then you have those four branches which are sticking out onto your lawn, obstructing your way. And for years together, they haven't given any goas. What do you do with them? You pray and ask the Lord. Maybe if you're spiritual, you go put your hand on top of the branch and you pray and say, like, you know, in the name of Jesus, bear fruit and all that stuff. Nothing has happened. What do you do? What do you do? Chop it off. It can't even hold a tire swing for your kids. It's weak. You chop it off. Put it in the fire. And that's what God does. When you don't bear fruit, it's going to 
all of us are expected to bear fruit as Christians. If we are not bearing fruit and the fruit that Christ wants us to bear, there is a problem there. And the principle of oneness means that you bear the fruit which comes from the root. The wine has got certain characteristics and the wine was meant to be bearing certain fruit through the branches. Have you seen trees where one branch has got apples, another branch has got chilies, another branch has got mangoes, another branch has got cucumbers? If you have a tree like that in your house, I just want to remind you that's not a tree, it's a refrigerator. All right? So you bear the same fruit that the wine is wanting the branches to bear. I was just referring to what John was talking about this morning uh, when he saw the picture of the mango fruit. And this mango fruit where the peel has been removed. You can only enjoy a fruit when the outer covering is gone, right? And you know, in the Bible, it talks about our hearts needing to be circumcised. You know what circumcision is? Where you remove the skin on top of it. So when God has called his people to be circumcised, he set them apart to reflect his glory and to expose the inside. And we are supposed to be exposing these circumcised hearts. And if you look at uh, Romans chapter 4, you would actually see there as to how, how, it's, uh, the importance of being circumcised in your heart. So it's very important. When you are bearing fruit, it's also important that this fruit that you're bearing is something that people can enjoy and that you're able to expose what's inside of you. If you have rottenness inside of you, you don't want to be circumcised there. You want it to be covered. It looks nice from the outside. But when you have something beautiful inside, you would want it to be enjoyed by others. And the principle of oneness, where it is the Lord who is giving you that life, and when he gives you that life, he gives you that identity, you just go ahead and be a blessing to others. Romans chapter 8 verse 16 talks about that oneness again. The Spirit, that's the Holy Spirit, Himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. The spirit of God telling the whole world, these are my children. These are my children. These are the children of God. And you know what? You have the spirit of God declaring to the whole world that we are the children of God. That's the principle of oneness. When you desire God, you reflect God. You bear his fruit. And what they see in God, they would see in you as well. That's what it is. And when you have that oneness with God, you would have that assurance deep inside of you that if I have God, I need nothing else. Let's look at Second Chronicles chapter 28, verse 9. A conversation that God has with King Solomon. First Chronicles chapter 28, verse 9. As for you, my son Solomon, know the God of your father and serve him with a loyal heart and with a willing mind. For the Lord searches all hearts and understands all the intent of the thoughts. If you seek him, he will be found by you. For if you forsake him, he will cast you off forever. Wow. God referring to Solomon and calling him my son, and then going on to say that he would search the inside of your heart. And when he comes in, when he dwells inside of you, when there is that oneness between you and him, the inside has to be cleansed. And the inside will have to be exposed for others to be a, a, a blessing. And it says, serve him with a loyal heart and with a willing mind. A heart that is in oneness with God, dwelling on the principle of oneness, desiring God, is also a heart which would just do what God wants us to do. You know, it's so interesting about King Solomon here at this conversation. If you look at the Old Testament, 
in the Old Testament, the only person with whom God said that I am your father was King Solomon. No one else. We know God as the father. The fatherly heart of God has been revealed to us in the New Testament through Christ Jesus. Pastor Victor taught about that. In the New Testament, the whole focus is on that. In that you know, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. That, you know, we pray to a father. But when you go to the Old Testament, the Lord identifies himself as the father of Israel, but the only person by name with whom God had the association as a father and son is Solomon. And you find that in 2 Samuel chapter 7, verses 12 to 15, when King David wanted to build the temple, God speaks through prophet Nathan and tells that you will not build the temple, but your son will build the temple. And you would find in verse 14 there, I will be his father and he shall be my son. And you find the same passage repeated again in three more instances. That's First Chronicles chapter 17, verse 13, First Chronicles chapter 22, verse 10, and First Chronicles chapter 28, verse 6. As you go to Matthew chapter 6, you find there a very familiar passage that we all are aware of. Why do you worry about your clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they are. Neither they toil nor spin. And yet I say to you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Now if God so clothes the grass of the field which is which today is and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? We read this passage multiple times. He talks about clothing, he talks about food, he talks about shelter. As we move on to verse 33, he talks about, do not worry about any of those things. Where did Solomon come in between? Talked about lilies of the valley and then compares it with Solomon. You see the connection with the Old Testament? For Solomon, God related to him as the father. And you move on to verse 33 in chapter 6 of Matthew. It says, do not worry about what you would wear, what you would eat and all that stuff. And then it says, for your heavenly father knows that you need these things. And then it goes on to say, seek ye first the kingdom of God and all these things will be added unto you. Hallelujah. If you understand the fatherly nature of God, you would desire only the Father and no one else. That brings me to the next principle, that's the principle of onlyness, the third principle. A desire for God reveals to us that He is our everything. My Father is my everything. Can you say that to your neighbor? Father is my everything. And when you have your father who is your everything, everything else gets added unto you. It becomes incidental. I don't know how many of you watch movies, but I haven't watched this movie, but I, um, you know, some movie scenes are like very popular, right? We keep seeing them with this YouTube generation. We see some of those clip things. You know, we see this movie uh, from Shole, that thing of Gawalo. That kind of stuff, you know, the guy who is drunk and standing up there trying to jump from there. And there's another movie called Divar. And you have this conversation between Shashi Kapoor and Amitabh Bachchan. Shashi Kapoor is uh, a police officer, an honest police officer, and Amitabh Bachchan, his brother. This guy is like, you know, he's gone into all kinds of stuff, businesses which are smuggling and, uh, you know, doing all kinds of underworld activities and now here they are, they are having this conversation where the police officer comes to his brother and says, you got to change your ways. And the rich brother is telling this guy, okay, what have you achieved by being a police officer? And then he makes the statement, like, you know, if you understand Hindi, you will understand it better. Like, you know, aaj mera paas building hai, property hai, bank balance hai, bangla hai, gaadi hai, kya kuch nahi hai, tumar paas kya hai? Shashi Kapoor turns around and says, I paas ma hai. Can you say this morning, I paas baap hai. <laughs> Hallelujah. Come on. You got the heavenly father with you. No matter what your friends tell you that you don't have, but you have got your heavenly father. Amen. You don't like the word baap?
in hindi they say he hamare baap tu jo aasman mein hai that's how the lord's prayer starts baap is not a bad word maybe it's a bad word in mumbai and in hyderabad kya hai baap kya chal raha hai nahi but here is like baap means father next time stand in a place of authority and say mere paas baap hai I have the heavenly father with me I need nothing else Hallelujah In Psalm 73 verse 25 it says Whom have I in heaven but you and there is none upon earth that I desire beside you You are up there in heaven for me and even here I desire nothing else but you Can that be a statement of faith that you can make Hallelujah and when you do that you come to that place of desiring god in an amazing way and you desire nothing else but god you desire not the blessings that god gives you but you desire god and god alone and everything gets added to you in 1996 there was a man by name joey uh, mara joey mara was uh, 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 was a uh, us uh, naval Uh, officer and this guy uh, was traveling in a aircraft carrier and he slips and falls from the aircraft carrier you know, those aircraft carriers are those huge ships on which you can land a plane and this us marine when he fell from there in the seas surrounding the country of iran in the cold winter season normally in that kind of a temperature people don't survive for more than 6 hours but these guys went and searched for him for 24 hours and they couldn't find him and finally they gave up the search and they sent a message to his uh, family saying that he is presumed dead 72 hours later in the pakistani waters the pakistani fishermen caught all of a guy who was floating on a piece of wood with his trousers wrapped around the piece of wood it was a survival technique that was taught to them in the navy and this guy was there his lips were cracked his tongue was cracked and he was delirious they took him there put him in the hospital revived him and then they asked him this question what made you stay alive how did you fight this fight you know his answer was the thirst for water and the quest for water made me stay alive panting for water and i kept on swimming and floating swimming and floating none of the water around me i could drink but i was searching for water what it gives life how many of you have of us have panted for water really panted for water is not really i know we have a marathon runner here john who's lifting up his hand so he possibly understand what it is to pant for water i mean you got a bottle of water with you keep sipping you don't understand the importance of water but when you are really dry then you know the importance of it in psalm 42 verses 1 to 2 it talks about this life giving water it says as the deer pants for the water brooks my soul longs for you o god my soul thirsts for god for the living god when shall i come and appear before god that should be the desire with which we go and run behind the presence of god and the presence of god when he fills you you keep getting filled more and more and you keep thirsting more and more you keep getting refreshed more and more you be filled with abundance and out of your innermost being will come streams of living water many more will drink and many more will be blessed that's the desire that you need to have but unfortunately today in today's world you find even in the christian church people not focusing on that aspect as much as people focusing on the externals in second timothy chapter 1 uh, chapter 3 verses 1 to 5 it talks about what kind of men would come in the future but know this that in the last days perilous times will come for men will be lovers of themselves lovers of money boasters proud blasphemers disobedient to parents unthankful unholy unloving unforgiving slanderers without self control brutal despisers of good traitors headstrong haughty lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of god having a form of godliness 
but denying its power, which means that everything that was said earlier is not about people out there, the wicked people, but it's also in the church also. Having a form of godliness, but denying its power. Then denying its power, then accepting whose power? Many times they rely on their own power. And from such people, turn away. It's not so different from what was told even in the book of Jeremiah, chapter 5, verse 30 and verse 11. It shows, an astonishing and horrible thing has been committed in the land. The prophets prophesy falsely. The priests rule by their own power. And many people love to have it so. My people love to have it so. But what will you do in the end? Today there are churches here in the world where they have walked so much away from the doctrine of the truth of God. Relying so much on their own strength. And so-called men of God have become lovers of power. They are false prophets. And unfortunately, as it says here in verse 31, and my people love to have it so. People want to go to a place where there's something that's happening. Hey, hang on. Don't focus on the miracles. Don't focus on what happens there, but focus on the giver of the miracles, the maker of the miracles. Don't focus on the man, but focus on God. It's very important. It's very important to turn away from the focus on the peripheral things, but to desire God only. Oswald Chambers said this, Christian workers fall, fail because they place their desire for their own holiness above the desire to know God. How do I paint myself in the public as a public figure? How do I portray myself? How do I build a brand for myself as a child of God or a servant of God and having all those beautiful titles like so-and-so, so-and-so of God. Come on, forget. First, first and foremost, they're a child of God. There ends the matter. Right? So it's important for us to really get back to the basics there. In Psalm 3, verse 3, it says, But you, O Lord, are a shield for me, my glory and the one who lifts up my head. My glory doesn't come because of the miracles that God does through me. My glory doesn't come because of the wealth that God has given to me. My glory doesn't come because of the talents that God has given to me. My glory doesn't come because of the people that surround me. My glory doesn't come because of what people tell me that who I am. But my glory comes because He is the lifter of my head. That's it. And that's all that we need to desire. We need to desire God and God alone. The last principle I want to place before you this afternoon is the principle of objectivity. We talked about the principle of ongoingness. We talked about the principle of oneness. We talked about the principle of onlyness. Let's talk about the principle of objectivity. It's about the desire for God producing the desire for the things of God. Nothing else moves my heart. Nothing else would stir my heart more than the things that stir God. That's it. If anything else is capturing your attention, it's not from God. Can I hear an amen for that? I know it's tough. Anything that does not capture his attention, if it is capturing your attention, there's something wrong. Catch what captures his attention. In 2 Peter chapter 1, Verses 5 to 9, it says, But also for this very reason, giving all diligence, add to your faith, virtue, to fa virtue, knowledge, to knowledge, self-control, to self-control, perseverance, to perseverance, godliness, to godliness, brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, love. For if these things are yours and abound, you will be neither barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For he who lacks these things is short-sighted even to blindness and has forgotten that he was cleansed from his old sins. It's a heavy passage. But let me start at the basic. Let's go back to verse 5. What does it say? Add to your faith 
virtue, which means faith is there right at the bottom as the first stone. You can go and do this exercise at home. You can possibly take a chart paper and put faith as a brick. On top of that, put another brick, virtue. On top of that, knowledge. On top of that, self-control. On top of that, perseverance. On top of that, godliness. On top of that, brotherly kindness. And on top of that, love. Woo. We get stuck right at the bottom. Do you have faith? Yes, I have faith. How much faith do you have? Faith the size of a mustard seed. That's enough, isn't it? Of course it's enough, but move beyond that, buddy. It talks about all those layers. And you see here, Peter writing this and saying, for if these things are yours and abound, which means they need to flow out from you. It's not just that they're there, you know, in some measure here and there. Abound means flow out for, from, from you. You will neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. You will know Jesus Christ more if you are exercising each of those foundation stones. Can I repeat that again? You will know Jesus Christ more when you are exercising each of those foundational stones. Virtue, knowledge, self-control, perseverance, godliness, brotherly kindness, and love from faith. And it says, for he who lacks these things is short-sighted even to blindness and has forgotten that he was cleansed from his old sins. How do we view the cross? Do we view the cross as a place where Jesus really redeemed us? If he has redeemed us, we need to understand that our sins have been buried out there. And we need to work our salvation moving forward by reflecting God's glory. Step by step, step by step, step by step, keep adding godly qualities. And the only way you can do that is by desiring God to have more control in your life. And the only way you will allow God to have more control in your life is by surrendering more to God. Can I hear an amen for that, please? Psalm 119, verse 104, it says, through your precepts, I get understanding. Therefore, I hate every false way. How do we get understanding? Through his precepts. And how do we know his precepts? When he speaks to us. We need to allow him to speak to us. And then we hate every false way. Everything else that everybody says is false. Psalm 51 verse 10 says, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast heart spirit within me. The spirit, the inner man has to be strong. Heart has to be clean. And then you find the presence of God in such a powerful way. And your life becomes a life with an objective. The principle of objectivity is a principle where you are looking forward step by step, step by step to grow in the Lord. I want to ask you this question. I don't know how many of you have really looked at your past and said, I grew in the Lord. And I don't know how many of you have looked at your past and said, I have grew enough and patted yourself on the back. If you said that I have grew enough, then you will stay there and you will rot there. But it's important for us to know that there's much more to grow in the Lord. And that can happen only when we desire God more and more. Those of you, if you have not understood redemption. I want to let you know that when Jesus said uh, when, 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 uh, when the Bible says in John chapter 3 verse 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. I just want to remind you if you're sitting here without having an experience of who Jesus is, Jesus is everything that God the Father had and he gave that everything for us. If you're standing up somewhere in what you think is the presence of God or a temple of God, and if you're asking that God, what have you given me? Let me tell you, he gave you his everything. And if he has given you his only son, he has given you everything. He didn't have hundreds of children. He had only one son and he gave him on the cross. And if you have not accepted Jesus as your Redeemer, 
This is a time for you to do that. Understand that there is that relationship beyond that cross to have God in your life and take control of your life. And everything comes in as an incidental package and your life will unfold in a beautiful way. And if you want to know more about it, you can talk to Pastor David after the service or John or anybody from the pastoral team or Pastor Victor when he's here. Take an appointment with anybody from the leadership team here and we can explain to you. Psalm 40 verse 8, it says, I delight to do your will, O my God, and your law is within my heart. A heart which has a desire for God is a heart which has the law of God written inside. And that law of God active with the godly nature being manifest. A.W. Tozer said this, May God grant us a desire for God that supersedes all other desires. And that's our prayer this afternoon for each and every one of us. No other desire should be greater than the desire of God. Desire for God. In Proverbs chapter 13 verse 19 it says, A desire accomplished is sweet to the soul. But it is an abomination to fools to depart from evil. A fool likes to do evil. A fool likes to be there in the presence of evil doers. A fool likes to speak evil. A fool likes to scheme evil. But a child of God would like to walk away from evil to a place where God is at work and allow God to take control of his life. Now, how do we do that? I just want to remind you of one principle here. Many times we take decisions in our lives that we can't implement. But it's important for us to speak into our lives and tell that we have to do it. Thank you for listening to this message. To know more about us, please visit www.adonai-ministries.com